We're going to end the discussion of the biological foundation with this question. How do we study the brain? And you already know much of this information. First of all, there are techniques such as ablation and lesioning. Here you deliberately go in and damage a portion of the brain, typically in non-human animals and after careful ethical considerations. But ablation involves damage to large portions of the brain and then allowing the animal to recover and seeing how behavior might change. Lesioning involves more precise damage to different parts of the brain and then allowing the animal to recover and seeing if there are any behavioral changes as a result of the surgery. You're already familiar with single cell recording. Here you are looking at the behavior of a single neuron while presenting different kinds of stimulation to one of the sensory modalities. Gross potentials involve looking at the behavior of many, many, many neurons simultaneously. And some of you are familiar with this already. You've taken EEGs or gross potential measurements of your brain activity. EEGs have been very useful to researchers who've studied sleep patterns or the brain's overall responses to the sound of music and other types of situations. Researchers also use fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging, PET scans, CAT scans, and MRIs. I'm sure you've heard of at least some of these techniques for studying the activity of the brain. Here's how I want you to think about it. Some of these techniques are invasive. Ablationing, lesioning, single cell recording, those are all invasive techniques for studying brain functioning. On the other hand, EEGs or gross potentials, fMRI, PET scans, CAT scans, and MRIs are non-invasive. They do not harm the individual or cause tissue damage of any sort while they're being conducted. Also, I want you to know that functional MRIs and PET scans record the ongoing activity of the brain. You can, for instance, watch how active different parts of the brain are while a person works a math problem. That's exciting. And CAT scans and MRIs are records of static or still images of the brain and very useful when someone has, say, a brain tumor or a damage to the brain. You can see in very great detail the exact location of that damage or that tumor. We have gotten well past the necessity to just wait for natural accidents to occur that cause brain damage and then wait for someone to die of natural causes and then perform autopsies to determine the specific sites of brain damage and relate that to behavioral changes. You do need to know that there are many different techniques for studying the brain. Some are invasive, some record ongoing activity, while others record static images, and they're all very useful. Finally, very final topic in the biological foundation. I want to mention cerebral dominance, also called lateralization or hemispheric specialization. These terms all refer to the idea that one hemisphere of your brain is better at some things than the other hemisphere. And this is carried way too far in pop psychology. You'll see magazine articles like, are you a left hemisphere person or a right hemisphere person? You know, are you an analytic person or are you a holistic kind of person? That carries it way too far. That's pop psychology, that's pseudoscience. But there are studies, and we do know that in some cases, one hemisphere of the brain may do things a little differently from the other hemisphere. For instance, you know that your left hemisphere, if you're right-handed, contains your speech centers. That's a case of hemispheric specialization or lateralization. And there is some research to suggest that perhaps your left hemisphere functions a little bit differently from your right hemisphere. For instance, that the left hemisphere tends to take a more analytical approach while the right hemisphere takes a more holistic approach. Think about facial recognition. Imagine that your friend Bob is walking towards you and you recognize him as Bob. It may be that your left hemisphere is recognizing Bob by analyzing the facial features. The nose is shaped this way, the ears stick out this much, so it's Bob. You recognize Bob. On the other hand, the right hemisphere may take a more holistic approach, looking at the face as a unitary object and ultimately recognizing Bob in that fashion. 
but it's important to remember that for most of us anyway as we go through our daily lives our left hemisphere and right hemisphere are both functioning and although they may do things a little bit differently from each other they are cooperating with each other they're working together to give rise to all of our experiences in the world